After decades in the making, experts have made a major scientific breakthrough, nuclear ignition. Humans have now replicated the process of how the sun makes energy on Earth. Scientists at the National Ignition Facility at the Lawrence Livermore Lab in California were the first to achieve this, but scientists around the world have contributed, including here in Chicago. We got to talk with Dr. Don Lamb, a professor of astrophysics at the University of Chicago. He helped develop a computer code to do experiments on the lasers used to achieve fusion ignition. I'm Don Lamb. Um, I'm a physicist on the faculty of the University of Chicago. And um, I'm an astrophysicist who has been doing for the last 20 years uh, developing the code to do experiments on the kind of lasers that we'll be talking about more today. Back in the uh, early 1960s, some physicists at Lawrence Livermore National Lab suggested using this kind of inertial confinement process rather than magnetic fields to reach the conditions necessary. And so this, what's happened is really the culmination of, you know, 70 years of efforts and research by thousands of scientists and with sustained funding from the Department of Energy and in particular the National Nuclear Security Administration. There are a lot of people who deserve incredible credit for this. So the connection that we have with this effort is Bob Rosner was the original director and then for the past 25 years I've been the director uh, of the Flash Center for Computational Science um, in the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the university. And we were selected by the National Nuclear Security Administration to build a sophisticated computer code that could not only you know simulate galaxies and clusters of galaxies and stars and so on but could actually simulate uh, supernova explosions uh, particularly the thermonuclear powered ones which are very very analogous to what we're talking about happening at NIF or in a thermonuclear weapon and so that began in 1997 and the center continues to this day and so we were able to build a, um, a really sophisticated computer uh, code that could do this. In 2010, uh, the National Ignition Facility was commissioned. And that year, the National Security Administration um, asked us if we would be willing to take on the task of adding all the physics capabilities to the code that would be necessary to simulate experiments at NIF. And um, that would required taking on adding capabilities, physical processes and so on, many, many more than the, all the ones that the code had actually had added to it up to then. And we agreed to do that. And so this code has enabled us to do experiments on NIF uh, since 2012, um, and many other people to do experiments at NIF and at other laser facilities around the world that have that help us to understand the physical processes, you know, that nature has thrown in our way. And the code now has a, a, a group of users that of over 6,000 uh, around the world have used the code for a variety of purposes. More and more, the majority is for these um, laser experiments. And, and you know, so th that's been a, a huge contribution. And perhaps an even greater contribution is um, the codes that are used in the weapons laboratories are classified. And so no one outside the laboratories or even in the laboratories that doesn't have a security clearance can use them. So how do you train young people to know this physics and be able to use computer codes to simulate things and also perhaps even more importantly, after simulating them, learn how to check whether you included everything you needed in the simulations or not. And so our code is completely open and freely available to every person in the world. And so a perhaps even the 
greater contribution we've made is to be able to train generations of young people as undergraduate students, graduate students, and postdocs, not only at the University of Chicago, but universities around the world. This facility was designed um, to produce this condition, which was necessary um, to check whether our nuclear weapon stockpile is, is uh, safe and reliable. And this came out of the decision to not do any more underground testing by the countries in the world who had nuclear weapons. But to, to be able to assure the reliability and, and the safety requires required being able to do experiments under the conditions that would happen in these weapons. And also along the way to develop really complex, sophisticated computer codes that could simulate these because we're now you know uh, 50 years from when the weapons were designed and you know 30 years from when anyone was tested so the the national ignition facility was one of the two pieces of this the experimental part and then there's the computer simulation part that are absolutely vital to assuring these two things about our stockpile. And one thing that's really important is that as uh, NIF failed to achieve ignition, then um, voices in the nuclear weapons establishment, a chorus grew louder and louder that um, this has failed and we need to uh, restart underground nuclear tests. And from my personal point of view, that would have that would be a catastrophe because that would mean that US, Russia, China would launch a nuclear arms race that we've never seen before on this earth. So from my point of view, that's a really, really you know, important uh, achievement. And one why I'm uh, just thrilled that this is, has been able to happen. A question I'm asked a lot of times is, okay, now that we've actually been able to do this and achieve break even in inertial confinement fusion, uh, nature can't throw any more tricks our way, but how long will it be before inertial confinement fusion can produce clean energy without radioactive uh, waste as happens with nuclear reactors or with, with uh, carbon generation and so on. And this is, hard to know the answer to uh, but we're in a different ball game now because it's really about you know some science but more technical and engineering uh, steps that have to be taken so I think it's um, less uncertain for sure whether it will be less than 50 years some people are saying 30 I think that's kind of optimistic um, you know is not clear there is one thing that I think is really important, and that is um, that when, when we're thinking about this kind of energy, it's not uh, really fair to only talk about how much energy the lasers put into the target and how much came out, because it started out with firing up these banks of capacitors and then there was some inefficiency, only 60% of that energy makes it into the laser beam. And then that, as it goes through the mirrors, drops down. So the amount that comes out is, you know, like 70 or 80%. And there are other inefficiencies. So um, if you ask how much energy we actually used, electrical energy we used compared to the energy coming out, we're still uh, a fairly large factor away from break even. And if we're going to do it to generate electricity for the world, you know, that we have to do. I just think that that that's, uh, you know, now less of a scientific challenge and more of a technical and engineering challenge, which I think means it won't keep getting pushed 50 years in the future from the point now. Um, what it does mean, which is very significant, is that 
we can't rely on a breakthrough of actually using this to generate electricity to, to stop climate change. We have to really focus on what we can do immediately to do this. And obviously this isn't it. On the other hand, in the long term, um, this won't will be clean energy and it is uh, hydrogen is in, incredibly abundant in the world. And so, you know, if we think in a more science fiction way about the future, um, eventually this could create enormous amounts of energy with no pollution and could transform the standard of living of everybody in the world by making it, you know, easy uh, and clean to provide them with the kind of electrical energy that people in the U.S. or in Europe have. So in the long term, and that's it, it, it will absolutely profoundly alter our world and hopefully for the better in sharing the energy and making it easier for, for everyone to have more abundant energy. And I think that this is the um, idealism of the young people who have joined this project, even in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the thousands and the 2010s, because this was their dream that they could some, in some way contribute to something that would be revolutionary for humankind on this planet. And they are all interested in saving the planet from climate change and they saw this is something with their technical knowledge and scientific knowledge a place where they can make a contribution to solving this really urgent and incredible problem i, th I think uh, this breakthrough really creates in me a humility about how each one of us can't contribute so much but working together we can make amazing things happen and i am so deeply grateful to all the people that came before me and young you know and older and who have been working you know putting their hearts into this over these decades and so i think it's a model that tells us we should be optimistic when we really decide to do something and work together to do it, remarkable, truly remarkable things can happen. And I think we need to, to, to remind ourselves of that and to use this breakthrough, you know, to think about that for our own selves.